The origin of the pandemic flu, his, history of the uh, Mexican swine flu uh, is, is very well known. Uh, I think one of the things that, uh, that people are becoming aware of is that flus don't necessarily exist in a vacuum. They, they actually come from the relationship of anim animals to, to uh, humans, usually on farms, uh, traditionally where pigs and ducks are, uh, are on the same uh, uh, place, where uh, in the case of an avian flu, the, it, it may get transferred to a pig, which then gets transferred to us. Uh, it, it may be of interest to realize that uh, the uh, biology and the physiology of the of the pig is very similar to the physiology of the human being, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're able to catch things from them, uh, not not necessarily easily, but it can happen. Where viruses that are affecting animals, such as pigs, can transfer to humans, they can mutate and transfer to humans. So this, this recent uh, virus outbreak started out with a big bang uh, in the spring of 2009 and, and it killed in short order 4,910 Mexican citizens and it resulted in 85 deaths. This was significant. However, uh, this quickly mutated, of course, uh, across the border and uh, across many borders due to the uh, uh, incredible um, amount of uh, of, of mobility of our populations throughout the world to 27,770 cases reported in the U.S. as, the, as of the time when I uh, put this uh, webinar together and, uh, and there was, there's only been uh, 127 deaths. I would uh, put this in comparison uh, that the ordinary flu which is reported, uh, uh, the ordinary seasonal flu is responsible for uh, 36,000 deaths, give or take 1,000 more or less, uh, because that figure is is disputed by some. But however it's disputed, there's a big difference between that number and the 127 deaths as of the, the, the this present time. Now, of course, things can change, and uh, and and that's one of the big concerns at the moment. So, what's so different about this H1N1 virus, and why why are pe why are we particularly concerned about it? First of all, it's claimed to be a new viral strain. Uh, the deadly post-4-1918 flu pandemic, which infected 40% of the world's population and caused 50 million deaths, was also an H1N1 type virus. This doesn't necessarily mean that this particular H1N1 virus will have the same uh, kind of repercussions. The other thing is that this virus seems to be uh, affect the younger population more than the older. Most people are, uh, who are older are recommended to get vaccinations for the flu because they are more vulnerable and uh, but in this case uh, it seems to be affecting children and middle-aged and teenagers, teenage people more uh, commonly and, and the deaths seem to be occurring in that age group more than the older population. And uh, it seems to be a previously unknown strain for which, uh, as, as we're told, we have no inborn immunity. Some perspectives on the flu's past might help us in this, uh, in understanding this. First of all, 10 to 20 percent of Americans come down with the flu during each flu season, uh, which ranges from November to March. And children are two to three times more likely than adults to get sick with the flu. And children frequently are one of the major ways that the flu spreads in the Western world because uh, as soon as school starts, as we're seeing to, uh, currently uh, in areas where the school has started, and uh, this particular H1N1 flu is incredibly contagious and uh, whole communities are, are being laid low by it. But uh, consistently, in all the places that I've heard reports from, it's been uh, it's been very very mild. So uh, most people recover, but in the United States, more than 100,000 people are hospitalized, and as I said previously, uh, 36,000, uh, a thousand more or less on either side of that, die from the flu and its complications every year. The complications of the flu are not to be underestimated. Oftentimes, these are bacterial in nature, not viral, 
and it's one of the reasons why when people go to the doctor with a with with a case of the flu, uh, a medical doctor might give them an antibiotic because uh, and, and they and they actually feel better afterwards, and that's because uh, the the individual may be suffering from a bacterial complication affecting their lungs and and possibly even bacterial pneumonia, in which case uh, antibiotics are an effective mode of treatment. Uh, previous flu, flu pandemics, we spoke about the 1918 flu. Uh, it was quite rampant. Uh, then we go to the 1957 Asian flu pandemic. Uh, this killed two million people caused by a human virus form. Um, in other words, a, a virus that was somehow or another uh, communicated directly from one human to another. Uh, and it combined with a mutated strain found in wild ducks. The impact of the pandemic was minimized by rapid action by health authorities who identified the virus and made a vaccine available speedily. And in this flu, the elderly were the most vulnerable. Um, in these earlier flus, it's not necessarily uh, that uh, treatment was what ultimately stopped them, but what actually seems to have been effective in many in most cases was hygi hygienic uh, practices that were put into place whether it was in this particular instance of the flu or uh, in 1957 or the more recent ones the hygiene which was which involves uh, washing hands frequently teaching people to do that and also quarantine shutting down schools and, and keeping people away from public places for per for a limited period of time so it wouldn't spread was found to be a very effective way in treating these conditions. In 1968, uh, some of us remember the Hong Kong flu. It was a pandemic of influenza and uh, it was another avian or bird type flu virus and it was first detected in Hong Kong and it spread to the United States later that year where it caused about 34,000 deaths, uh, making it the mildest pandemic in the 20th century. Containment with this, as I mentioned earlier, was through hygienic awareness. Then there was the 1976 swine flu. This, uh, the remembrance of this particular uh, flu gives rise to all kinds of, uh, of questions and uh, reservations that medical people today have about even taking the vaccine because uh, people are asking themselves, is history repeating itself? We have a 1976 swine flu in which uh, one man, a, an army private, uh, Private David Lewis, came down with the flu and within 24 hours he had died and uh, supposedly this flu had uh, uh, really didn't, resulted in 25 deaths, uh, but these deaths were from, not from the flu, but from the reactions to the uh, vaccine that was given to over 220,000 people. The vaccine was poorly uh, uh, tested and uh, it gave rise to some very serious reactions, neurological reactions, and uh, the government and, and, and the pharmaceutical companies were faced with the $1.3 billion in lawsuits. <clears throat> One, a, a little fact that, uh, that I need to verify is that I heard that uh, this private David Lewis who died at Fort Dix uh, was still required to go on a forced march with the flu and this was in the heat of, of the uh, er, uh, early uh, summer or spring and uh, the question of, of if, if he would, were to have maintained it himself, taken care of himself better, would he have survived it uh, remains as, as, a, as a something to consider here. <clears throat> 